Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite you to the next session of the War Crimes Research Group series. Together, today, uh, from 1 to 2.15, we are very happy because we have a second kind of roundtable regarding uh, contemporary uh, topics that arose out of the war on Ukraine. Of course, those topics are uh, will be examined in the broader context. Uh, but as you saw from the title of this web seminar, is uh, all questions, and then I put a question mark, new answers. So we have three experts who will talk about the use of force <clears throat> as a response, the possibility of use of force as a response to serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law, uh, another expert who will talk about war refugees, and a third expert who will talk about another phenomenon of using bello, which is related to foreign fighters. So uh, I don't want to take more time. I want to introduce you briefly um, our experts here. Our first expert is Dr. Marks. Envestein, uh, Svatika Envestein, Mark, I'm sorry about that, as legal scholar, but also a practitioner, a practicing lawyer, a refugee, criminal and immigration law from Germany. Mark recently published <coughs> with CUP his very interesting book on the history of humanitarian intervention. So Mark, I'm really looking forward to your comments, your thoughts, your reflections, you know, about the recent developments we have during the three weeks. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Dr. Ruby Ziegler. Uh, Ruby is an associate professor in international refugee law at Reading University School of Law, senior research associate of the University of Oxford, uh, with the University of London on refugee law, editor of many working paper series, and with a monograph as well on voting rights of uh, refugees. Ruby, thank you very much for being with us. I know you have to leave a little bit earlier. And our third speaker is uh, Dr. Emanuele Somario from uh, the Santana School of Pisa, Scuola, uh, so, uh, Emanuela, please um, uh, forgive me, you know, for not properly, an associate professor as well of international law, an expert in human rights, humanitarian law, disaster law. You're also director of an, a master program you have in human rights and conflict management since 2018, and a member of the ILA subcommittee on human rights in times of emergency. So what we are going to do during the next uh, hour and uh, 15 minutes is like that we are going to try to, to bring together issues from use at Bello, using Bello, but also refugee law uh, with a reflective tone. Having said that, you know, I stop here. I will give the floor first to Mark. I would like to invite <clears throat> our participants, you know, to use the q and I'm going to collect questions. And Mark, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, uh, for organizing. And let's see how this works. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Maria, for organizing this. And I'll be honest and say that I was much more looking forward to this when we were talking about organizing something like this a couple of months ago. After uh, this war has started, I really don't feel like there is that much to say about the legality uh, of the use of force during this war, because it doesn't seem to have an impact on whatever we say. But at the same time, we now are in a very uh, unprecedented situation in that there is this ongoing so-called specially special military operation uh, by Russia that has not only been condemned by a United Nations General Assembly resolution with a clear and overwhelming majority, which declared this operation an aggression against Ukraine in violation of Article 2.4 of the Charter. No, we also have something that we've not really had before, that is the International Court of Justice intervening, um, which has ordered on March 16, 2022, um, that uh, the, at the request of Ukraine, that the Russian Federation shall immediately suspend the military operations that, operations that it commenced on February 24, 2022 in the territory of Ukraine. And it has 
ordered that the Russian Federation shall ensure that any military or irregular armed units which may be directed or supported by it, as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control or direction, take no steps in furtherance of this illegal, clearly illegal military operation. But of course, um, the uh, aggression continues. Uh, there are clear indications of war crimes being committed. Millions of people have been forced to flee from their homes. Thousands have died. And we are try we're here to try and make some legal sense of this because that's our job. Maria has promised some new answers in the title of today's panel, but as a historian of humanitarian intervention, I can't really come up with anything new, but uh, at least maybe with, some with something um, you haven't heard before. It's clear that the Russian claim of an ongoing genocide of Russians in Ukraine as a cause uh, of their special military operation is an obscene abuse, not only of the term and concept of genocide, but of language and facts in general. Yet at the same time, it is a legal term and international law provides us with a language to talk about events happening in the world around us. It is a language that provides normativity, but also a language that provides ambiguity when not everyone understands or uses words the same way. The language, the lies that Putin uses to justify his aggression or the Russian aggression follow the pattern of humanitarian intervention with a repeated claim of the necessity to stop an alleged ongoing genocide of Russians in Ukraine. One might, find some hope in that, desperate for hope, at, at least I am, um, that this somehow shows some respect for international law, for a shared understanding of international law. But of course the opposite is true, as can be clearly seen from the fact that the Russians chose to ignore the one place where they could have argued their legal case, that is the hearing before the ICJ. They did later submit something, um, but at the actual hearing, their chairs were empty. And still the Russian choice of language is hardly accidental. And you will know probably that the Russian view on what has happened in Ukraine is not only completely different in terms of what they see as the facts, but also the normative consequences of these facts. So the fact that Russia is using a language that corresponds to images of international law may tell us something. That language apparently also works at least within Russia, where there is we don't know how widespread, but there is support for the Russian actions. And I've had more, <clears throat> I've had uh, heard more than one conversation with Ukrainians who talk about their disbelief over the reactions of relatives in Russia who suggest that they, the Ukrainians, are lying to them when they tell them they are under attack. And we must also note that while the support for the United Nations General Assembly resolution against the Russian aggression was overwhelming, the countries that did not support it make up about half of our planet's population. I would therefore want to reflect some more on the language of international law, which is a language of its, that is a product of its time and place. And whatever your take on the current events, there, the, the place in international law, the place of words, of meanings, is determined, at least in a very broad sense, by the future development of our shared world. I want to focus on the nuances of the claims that Putin is putting forward to justify his actions, which, as the <coughs> official propaganda insists, do not translate as war, as they are clearly intended to add legitimacy, not legality, to what is happening. In a sense, Putin claims that in Ukraine there are Russians, which here is for, first and foremost an ethnic category, though given the chance Russia also issues passports to them, um, that there are Russians in Ukraine that the Russian state is authorized to protect. Russia, Russia has been engaging in what can be, can be called passportization in Ukraine since at least April 2019, and residents of separatist-controlled parts of Ukraine can become Russian citizens via simplified procedures since then. This fast track was made possible by a presidential decree issued by Putin, which accelerated the naturalization process from at least eight years to under three months, allegedly for humanitarian reasons. We can refer to this as a claim of right of the ethnic state 
to ethnic intervention on the territory of the state of residence, irregularly interfering in the rights of ethnic groups settled on his territory by force or through discriminatory laws. This does sound somewhat clumsy, I'll admit, um, but it's a translation of um, uh, an old German claim of a right to intervention, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Russian, tech, Russian and Soviet textbooks before them tend to stress the principle of non-interference and the principle of sovereign equality as two sides of the same coin. So they wouldn't go as far as express, ex, expressing any rights of what I will call now ethnic intervention or co-national intervention, even though that is precisely what um, Putin is claiming. Um, and the theory of co-national intervention that what has that was developed uh, in the early 20th century by German international lawyers um, is rooted in um, uh, development of um, rights. Uh, to protect national minorities um, and goes back to the second half of the 19th century. Um, and that is also um, the time where some theorists also saw the roots of the idea of humanitarian intervention. And I want to just as an example, go therefore back to 1937 and um, the dissertation by Hermann Mosler who was then a young German lawyer, um, um, but who went on to become a distinguished international lawyer and a highly respected judge in the International Court of Justice. In 1937, um, Mosler published his doctoral dissertation, Die Intervention im Völkerrecht, which contained, as a statement on policy rather than law, a commitment to the right of the ethnic state to act to protect the minority rights of ethnic co-nationals with the citizenship of third countries. Back then, he took the then still unique position, contrary to all major writers on international law, of allowing for a right to intervene on behalf of ethnic, folkish minorities for the purpose of reorgan reorganizing Eastern Europe. Obviously. Um, I, Putin probably has not read Hermann Mosler. He would have read Karl Schmidt, um, who is referenced by Mosler. But I think it's quite remarkable um, if one reads uh, this dissertation from 1937 um, now, and um, there are clear parallels to uh, the arguments that Russia is putting forward. Mosler repositioned the question of the admissibility of intervention along ethnic lines, finding ethnicity trumping justice. The ethnic ideology is considered as establishing the principle of non-intervention into the affairs of other states as the cornerstone of an international law explicitly based on a modern type of natural law, whereas interventions in the name of justice are considered inadmissible. Mosler saw He's quoting Hitler, then uh, Nazi Germany walking, working toward establishing legal rights for minorities under international law. And in Mosler's construct, national socialist ideas of a reorganization of international law along ethnic lines work to strengthen minority rights, though only those based on bloodlines. For the case of alien racial minorities, which is my translation of his term, Rassefremde Volksgruppe, living scattered among the dominant ethnic groups, no case could be made for any corresponding legal right as a minority, and thus no grounds for intervention. Mosler saw also uh, the formation of circles of international law, Völkerrechtskreis, that is um, these are areas developing in which a particular form of international law applied. His existing examples in 1937 were uh, the British Empire and the political order of America. He obviously also thought uh, of Eastern Europe as a place where Germany should be legally allowed under international law to 
um, intervene to establish the natural order. Um, and it's difficult not to think that Putin would have appreciated such ideas. I mentioned this example and um, we, it's possible to go into this even further because um, the Nazi international lawyers did really think about minority rights as grounds for legal intervention um, a lot. And um, there's a whole strain of German international law thinking related to minority rights that is contrary to uh, human rights ideas um, but uses that, that we have today, um, um, but uses a very similar language and does indeed envision um, a, a world order based along um, ethnic lines that corresponds eerily to um, Russia's idea of uh, th their, their ethnic spheres of influence. And um, I'm, I'm, I will stop uh, at Mosler because Mosler is, is really went on to become a very, very distinguished international lawyer. Uh, in, and um, his dissertation later was, was also praised uh, when uh, on the 50th anniversary of his doctoral dissertation, they, they even had a celebration at uh, the university, um, which happened to be the University of Bonn, where I also study, which I think is if you look at really the details of um, the, the line of thinking he put forward back then is, is not understandable because um, it is so clear that um, that was a textbook in a way for an aggression like the one um, that Russia uh, has unleashed on, um, on Ukraine, um, but it didn't hurt his career. So um, I, hopefully um, the, the people who, who put forward justifications for uh, the Russian actions will not have such distinguished um, international careers as Hermann Moslet. And um, with that, I um, would like to stop. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, it was a wonderful introduction and very different introduction, bringing historical elements, you know, based on very little justifications for the use of force. <clears throat> I hadn't realized that we, I hadn't thought that we'd go back to Lebensraum uh, logic, you know, exactly while listening to Putin and the others, very, very true. Uh, but <clears throat> knowing the history, the legal history behind these arguments, and I think your your book uh, clearly offers um, this perspective. is very very important to understand also uh, broader implications. And your last comment about careers, legal careers, you know, it's also yeah. Uh, we can we can talk about that uh, another time. But thank you very much. It's the, it's the first introduction to the topic. And having said that, I want to give the floor to Ruby. Thank you very much, Mark. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much, Maria, and uh, for inviting me and uh, um, and to everyone who is attending. So um, let me try and share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Uh, I don't have many slides, but I uh, I'm going to have primarily a, a holding slide of sort. Um, so uh, so this is me, uh, and these are these are the issues that I will be um, this sort of uncovering or covering in, in the short talk. So. Um, let's get started. So, so the conflict that was prompted by Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine has already caused the largest external displacement on the European continent in well over 60 years. Right? The numbers are dwarfing arrivals in Europe during the so-called 2015 Syrian refugee crisis. And so in this presentation, what I shall address is the external displacement from Ukraine, and I will do so drawing on IHL 
any and international refugee law separately. So for those interested, uh, Maria's kindly put in the chat um, chapters that I've written about the relationship with, between those two regimes and how they affect interpretive questions. Those arise in particular um, contexts such as regional regimes. So the EU Qualification Directive, Article 15C is a case in point. And I'm very happy to discuss uh, these, um, uh, as you were, at a later point. But for, for today, um, what I wanted to do is, is speak about those five themes on your screen. So the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive for the first time by the EU, uh, the, the link between displacement and the 1951 Refugee Convention, the notion of explicit protection from reforma in IHL, and the notion that there is an implicit non-reforma obligation that is much broader uh, conceptually uh, in IHL in common article one of the four Geneva Convention. And then finally talk hopefully on the day when hostilities do cease and the way in which the question of non-reforma may also affect uh, the issues around prisons of war. So on the first theme, um, the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive. So, as you will know, um, most of the countries uh, bordering Ukraine on, on its west side uh, are EU member states, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania. Uh, and for over 20 years, um, the Temporary Protection Directive, which was developed in the aftermath of the mass displacement from the Balkans, has never been activated. Right? The, we had previous crises, as I said, the so-called um, refugee crisis in 2015, but there was never the political will to activate it. On this occasion, very quickly, uh, within a week after the, uh, the invasion started, uh, the EU Council, um, which acted on a proposal from the Commission, unanimously on this occasion, unanimously agreed to activate it. Uh, and that decision was made in response to what is referred to in the language of the directive as a mass influx of displaced persons. And so the way that is defined is the arrival in the EU of a large number of displaced persons who come from a specific country or geographical area, whether their arrival in the EU was spontaneous or aided. And what the directive does, it sets out minimum standards for giving temporary protection. And quite um, importantly, it adopts measures that promote what they call a balance of efforts between the member states in receiving such persons and in bearing the consequences thereof. So that's code in EU jargon for responsibility sharing, precisely the issues that um, try, tragically we know haven't really uh, been manifested in previous crises. Now, the interesting thing about the way the Temporary Protection Directive has been um, activated here is that it doesn't just apply to Ukrainian nationals who uh, were displaced from Ukraine. It also applies to third country nationals or indeed to stateless persons who are in Ukraine and are unable to return to their country of origin in safe and durable conditions. So that would include someone who was an asylum seeker or a refugee in Ukraine on the 24th of February uh, or uh, later on. Uh, and, and we all remember the scenes from last autumn of Polish soldiers at the Polish-Belarus border who were violently pushing back asylum seekers from Afghanistan who were trying to cross into the European uh, Union territory. On this occasion, uh, the, the Temporary Protection Directive means that anyone in that position from Ukraine would be able to cross into an EU member state and enjoy the, um, um, the contours, the, the application of the, of the directive. And the directives also extended its application to those who are family members of either Ukrainians uh, or third country nationals or stateless persons in those positions. Now, how does that regime sit alongside general refugee protection? So temporary protection is granted without prejudice to the recognition of refugee status under the 51 Refugee Convention. Uh, and member states are allowed not to uh, let individuals hold both temporary protection status and asylum seeker status simultaneously. So the practical matter will be uh, most likely that anyone who holds temporary protection um, status will not be applying as long as they still hold that status for asylum. What happens once that status ceases, uh, which um, at most will be three years from its activation, but maybe shorter, uh, I'll come to in a second, right? Um, so the interesting question is, um, there is, there is a possibility for member states to exclude people from protection, 
um, on the same grounds that they would be able to exclude them from refugee protection. So the, the exclusion clauses in the Refugee Convention, the most relevant of which in the current context is that the relates to uh, Article 1F1 of the Convention, so the Commission of War Crimes, one can envisage situations where member states might want to exclude people from protection uh, on those grounds. Now, what happens was, I say, once um, the Temporary Protection Directive ceases to apply, one can foresee a scenario, for instance, if the negotiations lead to Russia, either the, the URE or de facto continuing to control certain parts uh, of Ukrainian territory after cessation of hostilities, one can see how, say, LGBT plus people who were reasonably uh, able to live in those areas under Ukrainian control would not be able to return to those places after the cessation of hostility. So that would be a scenario of uh, the creation of so-called in refugee law, uh, a refugee surplus situation. Now, now let's take a step back and think about the fact that the EU has activated temporary protection directive here for the first time. Now, on the one hand, um, we should praise it for acting decisively, rapidly, and indeed with unanimity. And, and the comparison with the, the clumsy and inefficient way that um, this country, the UK, has been dealing with Ukrainian refugees uh, actually does, does put the latter to shame. Right? But at the same time, I think, uh, and especially in an international forum, we need to be critical of the inability to agree similar measures in previous crises, and indeed the propensity the EU has to generally actively prevent refugees from arriving on European shores through its various externalization policies with Libya, with Turkey and the like. Um, and of course, it was also easier for the EU to take this step in relation to Ukrainians, precisely because Ukrainians, even before the 21st of February, did not require a visa to come as tourists to the European Union. And so in that sense, their need for so-called safe and legal routes to the EU really relate to, at the moment, being able to get to the EU border. But there was no point in which um, the EU was in a position to deny Ukrainians entry because it is a visa-free country. And that is, by definition, very different uh, for any other country in the top 10 refugee producing countries globally. So Syrians, Iraqis, Afghans, Eritreans, um, all require visa, which is ultimately denied to them. Uh, and, and the other thing I think to highlight about the differential treatment uh, of Ukrainians in this context is that the EU Council decision explicitly states that Ukrainian nationals as visa-free travelers can choose the member state in which they want to enjoy the rights and attach to temporary protection, and indeed to join family and friends across the, what the EU called the significant diaspora networks that currently exist across the Union. Um, and they say in the statement, this would in fact uh, facilitate the balance of efforts between member states and reduce the pressure on national reception system. Now, this is entirely sound, right? This is, this is precisely the rationale for what many of us um, see as the flaw in the Dublin system, uh, which ultimately assumes that people must um, seek asylum in their first country of asylum, even though uh, of arrival in the EU, even though it's not a legal requirement for them to do so. Um, but, it, but for any other country they will move to, that country is able to return them back to their first country of entry. And that, of course, creates a disproportionate burden, uh, as we saw in 2015 with Syrian arrivals. So one can really only hope that, um, you know, seeing the light in the context of Ukrainians may transpire to future crises, which sadly we know uh, are likely to happen. So, so this deals with, with the temporary protection directive. Let me move to uh, how um, displacement interacts with the 51 refugee convention definition. So of course, contrary to popular myth, um, refugee law doesn't require refugees to seek asylum in their first country of entry. Uh, and nor is refugee status affected by transiting through various countries. So uh, refugee status is, is a declaratory status. Uh, and so countries that are beyond Ukraine's border, and that includes those that require Ukrainians to obtain a pre-arrival visa, must consider asylum applications from persons displaced from Ukraine, irrespective of whether they have transited through one or more countries on their way here. And uh, that almost by definition will be the case for anyone coming to the UK, for instance. Um, now, Article 182 of the Refugee Convention defines a refugee as someone who's outside their country of nationality or habitual residence, 
due to a well-funded fear of persecution for one or more of the five convention reasons, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, and who is unable or unwilling on those grounds to avail themselves of the protection of their state. Now, this provision does not refer to an armed conflict, either a necessary or a sufficient eligibility criteria. Uh, and yet in the past, uh, and in fact, in the present, because the handbook is still uh, valid um, since its latest update in 2011, the UNHCR handbook says, and I quote, persons compelled to leave their country of origin as a result of international or national armed conflict are not normally considered refugees under the 1951 convention or 67 protocol. That's the famous or infamous paragraph 164. Um, and that so-called war flaw has prompted much debate and it's led UNHCR to clarify in their own language, this statement in a guidance that they issued in 2016. Well, what they claim is in paragraph 33, and I quote, rarely are modern day situations of armed conflict and violence characterized by violence that is not in one way or another aimed at particular population or which does not have a disproportionate effect on a particular population, creating this causal link to a convention ground. So that seems to have been almost a 180 degree um, flip in UNHCR's position. Uh, and in fact, they, they even deal in the guidance with the question of mass influx. Um, and they say the fact that there are many or all members of particular communities are at risk, that does not undermine the validity of any particular individual's claim. So the so-called differential impact test that used to be applied to those uh, fleeing armed conflict needing supposedly to show their risk is over and above those that are normal in um, conflict, that is rejected. And so it is indeed the case that in most contemporary armed conflict, like the one in Syria, uh, very many of those who have fled the conflict will have had a well-funded fear of persecution for several of the convention ground. So think, for instance, about um, those who were um, Yazidis, Yazidi women, Yazidi children, and men under uh, Islamic State rule. They were virtually all under threats that fits uh, very neatly, as you were, within the 51 convention. Um, in the circumstances in Ukraine, there is a difficulty here, which is that the IHL presumption that nationals will not ordinarily sever their ties to their country of nationality. That if you are Ukrainian, you still enjoy the protection of Ukraine. That sits uncomfortably with the requirement in Article 1A2 that people have to be unable or unwilling to avail themselves of their state's protection, either because their state is the agent of persecution or because it's unable or unwilling to protect them from persecution that emanates from non-state actors. Uh, this is, of course, very different for those who are fleeing areas in Ukraine that are presently controlled by Russian forces. Because those areas, um, obviously, neither Ukraine can provide protection in, nor can, um, knowing what we know now, can anyone expect Russia to effectively protect people uh, from persecution. So anyone fleeing those areas uh, would obviously meet the definition. Um, so, so this really deals with refugee law. What I want to do in the remainder five minutes or so uh, is talk about where IHL comes into the picture. Um, so IHL really speaks to reformer both explicitly and implicitly. And it speaks explicitly in rather limited form. So uh, while IHL obviously envisages destruction, death, and ultimately displacement, the expectation is that if you adhere to and respect IHL rules, not least those that differentiate between civilians or distinguish between civilians and combatants, you can minimize displacement of civilians. Uh, well, we see the horrid picture that emerges from Ukraine of utter disregard to any principles of IHL, no doubt is contributing to the mass displacement that we see. So the clearest articulation in IHL of the principle of non reforma is in Article 45.4 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The notion that protected person, quote unquote, should, uh, and I quote, in no circumstances be transferred to a country where they may have reason to fear persecution for political opinion or religious belief. The problem is that this provision only applies to civilians who find themselves in the hand of a party to the conflict of which they are not nationals. So it would only apply to Ukrainians in the hands of Russia or 
uh, or Belarus potentially, and Russians in the hands of Ukrainians, but it doesn't apply beyond uh, the, that remit. And so it is a very limited scope in this context, which is why, and this takes me to the fourth point, um, I uh, very much believe in the uh, application of what I see as an implicit non reforma obligation in IHL. Um, and so the first point to note is that in this international armed conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the applicability of the common Article 1 to the Four Geneva Convention is not in doubt. And what I've argued previously is that if you read that provision purposively, the undertaking to quote unquote respect and ensure respect for the conventions in all circumstances must mean that when people who are not taking an active part in hostilities flee to any country that is a signatory to the convention, any high contracting party uh, from territories where there are violations of the Geneva Convention that are either occurring or likely to occur, then the obligation to ensure respect for the convention requires state parties or state parties not to refile such persons back to those territories as long as the risk to expo of exposure to those violations persists. And indeed, the ICRC agrees with that point. I also believe that that position is consistent with the various obligations that exist ergo omnes under, say, Article 146 um, of the Forced Geneva Convention to repress grave breaches and the obligations to take measures that are necessary for suppressions of all acts that are contrary to the provisions of the convention. Um, so to me, the grim picture that emerges from Ukraine leaves really little doubt that at the time of writing, or of speaking about this rather, uh, returning persons to Ukraine could expose them to serious violation. And that given the dynamic nature of um, the conflict in Ukraine, that applies virtually anywhere in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, and that suggests to me that any country in the world, frankly, uh, that um, is a signatory to the convention, and this, these conventions are universally ratified, has an obligation not to return people to Ukraine pursuant to IHL, uh, irrespective of whether um, the refugee law framework uh, would or would not apply to every single person uh, in those positions. Uh, that, of course, is both a legal action, it infringes no country's sovereignty, uh, and it is, in my view, of course, also morally requirement. So the final point I want to make is about non reforma et cessation of hostilities um, and the return of prisoners of war. So IHL operates under a rebuttable presumption that nationals enjoy the protection of their country. And the consequence of that is that the assumption is that a prisoner of war will want to return to their country after the hostility cease. And so IHL is rather equivocal about this. It says in Article 118 of the Third Geneva Convention that um, return, release and repatriation of POWs has to take place without delay. Uh, but the 2020 ICRC commentary to the convention, I believe rightly notes that whilst refusal to return cannot be based on quote unquote mere convenience, an obligation to repatriate must be understood as being subject to an exception where the prisoners face a real risk of violation of fundamental rights by their own country. And that is an interpretation which the ICRC says accords with the principle of non reforma So to conclude, the reality of mass external displacement prompted by conflict isn't new and the way non-belligerent countries in particular should respond the extent to which their actions are legally required rather than purely morally desirable ultimately depends both on our adopting purposive interpretation of existing obligations and indeed on political willingness to avail ourselves of bespoke protection devices like the temporary protection directive. Now it's encouraging to see responsibility sharing and solidarity uh, in reception of displaced Ukrainians and I dare hope that the same principles would apply without discrimination to those seeking protection wherever they come from. Um, when the conflict ends, some of those that are externally displaced will still have protection needs. Um, and others who are currently receiving protection under the temporary protection directive, the EU will have lost family members left behind and may be unable to return because of obliterated residential areas they once inhabited. So my hope is, 
that the spirit of generosity in which they'd be welcome across the channel will not wane even when formal protection obligations cease. So with that, I leave you with that, I think, uh, very um, still prescient sign, in, at least in relation to the UK. Um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruby. Uh, so many issues, you know, both you and Mark touched upon, but the question of double standards, you know, that we all experience when we talk about, you know, the reaction of Europe uh, to this crisis, you know, is very pertinent. And also, you know, linking that to IHL and our common article one of the four Geneva Conventions and about the duty to respect and ensure respect. So thank you very much for your interesting input, comments, and, um, and your final reflective thought. So having said that, you know, I want immediately to give the floor to Emanuele. And uh, Emanuele, uh, you will talk about another pertinent issue. Today, before we started, I was reading about 1,000 Wagner uh, groups, you know, their reports uh, that they are about to operate, I don't know, in Ukraine, but we know, you know, that the phenomenon of foreign fighters is not a new phenomenon, but it definitely, you know, takes another perspective on the war in Ukraine. So you have the floor. Thank you. Yes. Can you all hear me properly? Yes, yes. Great. Thank so thank you. Thank you, Maria, very, very much for your kind words and for inviting me. I also want to express a sense of awkwardness for discussing these issues while there are horrible things going on in the Ukraine. But as Mark was suggesting, it's our job. So here we are. So I'd like to start my, uh, my brief speech from a few headlines which I came across over the last few days describing the involvement of foreign citizens in the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine. These individuals have been referred to with different names, including volunteers, foreign fighters, foreign combatants, um, but also mercenaries. Uh, and this is a term that we have come to associate with a very negative phenomenon. So the question I would like to provide an answer with, uh, to in, in the coming 15 minutes is, what is the legal status of these foreign individuals who have joined the fight in Ukraine? And why does it matter? And what are the consequences of attributing one or the other status to these individuals. So first of all, which part of international law applies to the matter and which treaties in particular? As um, Ruby was saying, we know that this is a situation of armed conflict, which is regulated by international humanitarian law. So the branch of international law that imposes duties and, and rights on belligerent parties. We also know that this conflict is an international armed conflict to which the four Geneva Conventions apply and also additional protocol one to the conventions of 1977, and both Russia and Ukraine are parties to these treaties. So what do these treaties say about the various, various types of, of status that individuals involved or affected by an armed conflict uh, can, can have? Well, the main distinction, as uh, we probably know, is the one between combatants on one hand and, and civilians on the other. Who are combatants? Combatants are those individuals who are entitled to take part in hostility, so mainly the regular soldiers of, of uh, national armies. And they also have the right to be granted prisoner of war status if captured. Huh? And being granted POW status is a very nice thing because you enjoy a number of rights and privileges, including the right not to be tried for taking part in hostilities and the right to be sent home uh, once the conflict is over. The flip side, of course, is that they are basically always legitimate military target, or unless they are uh, over the combat. Then we have civilians. Civilians instead should not participate in the fighting. They should also enjoy protection from the effect of, of uh, hostilities. If they do directly participate in hostilities, of course, they lose the immunity from attack and they can, be, um, they can be targeted, and in case of capture, they can be tried for the very fact that they have taken up arms, uh, unlike combatants. And then there is a third category, which is usually mentioned in uh, connection with uh, citizens of third countries who join the conflict, which is the category of mercenaries. And these sort of fighters have obviously a very bad uh, reputation because mercenaries are usually linked to the idea of fighting uh, for an economic gain, and they uh, were involved in the past in attempts to overthrow government or destabilize governments. And this is why states have tried to outlaw these activities, the recruitment, the um, hiring of mercenaries through specific treaties, 
and also IHL addresses the phenomena, uh, more specifically Article 47 of Additional Protocol 1, who defines who a mercenary is for the purpose of the protocol, and states that they shouldn't take part in hostilities, and if they do take part in hostilities and they're captured, they should not enjoy um, a POW status. Hmm? So the question is, under which of these categories do foreign fighters fighting in Ukraine fall? And in order to understand this, we need to start from the definition of combatants, which is included in uh, the Geneva Convention and Additional Protocol 1. And the most relevant provision for our purposes is the one of uh, um, uh, common Article 4, uh, sorry, Article 4A of the First Geneva Convention, paragraphs 1 and, and 2 who describe who is entitled to, PO, uh, to combatant status and hence to POW status if, if captured. Paragraph one starts by saying that um, a combatant is whoever is a member of the armed forces of a party to the conflict. So the regular uniformed units of a state, they are all combatants. But then it also includes members of militias and volunteer corps that are part of such armed forces. So you might have a unit of individuals who uh, is not initially part of an armed force, but then is incorporated in the, in, into the armed forces. And even those individuals would then enjoy combatant status. Uh, note that what is decisive to establish if you are a member of the armed forces, or if uh, in case you fight in a militia, if your militia belongs to the armed forces of a party to the conflict is national law. So it's the national legal framework which is determinative in, 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 in making this sort of decision. Then we have another category of individuals, which instead refers to individuals who are members of militias who are not formally party, a part of, of, of an army, but de facto they fight alongside one of the parties of the conflict. And these individuals, these members of these militias, they are to be considered combatants and hence are entitled to POW status if they fulfill a certain number of criteria, that of carrying arms openly, uh, having a fixed and distinctive sign recognizable at distance, uh, acting under, a, let's say, a responsible command, and let's say, respecting the gist of international humanitarian law. If they fail to respect any of these criteria, then they lose their right to be considered prisoner of, uh, or prisoners of war. Now note that in none of these provision, uh, none of this provision ever mentions the need to possess a certain nationality in order to join a regular army. Hmm? In fact, if you think of it, there are plenty of units even within Western armies that are composed entirely or partially of foreign citizens. The foreign legion in the French army, the Gurkha battalion in the British army. So. Obviously, nobody would question the fact that these soldiers are, in fact, legitimate combatants and should be entitled to POW status if, if they get captured. So where does this, do, does this leave us with respect to the foreign fighters who have, let's say, flocked to, to, into Ukraine over the last uh, few weeks? And as Maria was mentioning, we're talking about thousands of individuals. Well, the vast majority of these individuals has gone through a recruitment process which ended up in a formal enrollment. Hmm? Ukrainian law allows for the recruitment of foreign or, or stateless individuals within their army at least since 2016. And this is why, in my opinion, there is no significant difference between the members of uh, what is called the International Legion of Territorial Defense of Ukraine, this is the name which has been given to this foreign legion, and the French Foreign Legion, for instance. So all of these individuals are legitimate combatants. Um, even if they were to join Ukraine as a group, Ukrainian authority could decide to incorporate the group into the regular army. Hmm? Uh, and so they would still uh, be considered as legitimate combatants. And according to the ICTY, which had to address a similar case with respect to the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in the early 90s, this incorporation could also occur during the conflict. So it's not something which needs to be done uh, ex ante. A third alternative for them would be, let's say, not to join, uh, formally join uh, the Ukrainian army, but they would still be entitled to combatant status if they were to fulfill the additional criteria I was mentioning uh, of uh, Article 4A2. So wearing a fixed and distinctive sign, carrying arms openly, and so on and so forth. 
the question would be what happens if instead uh, they join the conflict because you know they want to get paid more because of their um, interest for, um, for, 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 for earning more money. Uh, in this case, they could be included in the third category we've mentioned at the beginning, namely, they could be considered mercenaries. Yet the definition of the term mercenary provided by additional protocol one is rather narrow. Mm -hmm. A mercenary is someone who is specifically recruited to take part in the conflict who actually does participate in the conflict, who is essentially motivated by a desire to make money and is promised a compensation which is, let's say, significantly higher than that of an ordinary soldier. He or she does not to, uh, need to be, cannot be a, a citizen of one of the states uh, who are fighting in the conflict. Um, so we see that there, there are many additional criteria which, which all need to be uh, respected uh, at the same time uh, and the definition is so narrow that a famous commentator once said that a mercenary who cannot exclude himself from this definition deserves to be shot and his lawyer with him. So it's, it's really difficult to be uh, labeled as a mercenary. Uh, quite clearly, I would say that foreign fighters siding with Ukraine are, are not there for the desire to you know, have some uh, material gain, but for more for uh, idealistic purposes. We are fighting against an authoritarian regime or to defend democracy, et cetera. So it's difficult. They, I mean, the exclusion clause of Article 47 would already kick in to, to, to make sure that they are not considered mercenaries. Of course, and here I come to um, what Maria was uh, saying, the same criteria should also be applied with respect to the foreign fighters joining the conflict alongside Russia, hmm? including those working for so-called private military companies such as the Wagner Group or other uh, companies who, who are in this line of business, let's say. Um, if they are formally incorporated into the national army, then this is the end of it. Uh, they are uh, combatants and they should be granted POW status if captured. Or they might fall within the category of militias fighting alongside one of the parties to the conflict. So if they fulfill the additional criteria of, of um, paragraph 4A2, again, wearing a fixed distinctive sign and so on, then they would be equally entitled to uh, combatant status if, if captured. And this was recently confirmed also by the commentary of the ICRC to the third uh, Geneva Convention of 20, 2020. Uh, but what if they're not formally linked to the Russian state? Let's say they are hired by a private company to protect uh, its property on Ukrainian territory. Even then, it would still be difficult to consider them as mercenaries in the sense of Article 47 of Additional Protocol 1, because one should look at again, many uh, as many uh, elements. First of all, uh, whether their activity really constitutes direct participation in hostilities. Uh, you might have a use of violence uh, in the territory of a state which is affected by a conflict which does not amount to direct participation in hostilities. You should look at which nationality they have because members of the Wagner group ma might have a Russian nationality. So in this case, remember, you, you cannot be deemed a considered a mercenary if you are the national of one of the belligerent states. And since Russia is one of the belligerent states, this would exclude them from being considered mercenaries. You should see whether you have been specifically recruited to fight in the conflict. And again, members of private military companies very often are, let's say, permanent employees of the company they, 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 they work for. So uh, you would have to prove that a specific individual has been recruited uh, in particular precisely to join the conflict in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, one last thing, and then uh, I conclude, is that we should remember that whatever their status, huh, every individual falling into the hand of one of the parties to the conflict should uh, at least enjoy the minimum guarantees uh, the minimum protection which are listed in Article 75 of Additional Protocol 1, which is titled Fundamental Guarantees and does in fact contain some minimum standards of treatment that should preserve the well-being and the dignity of anyone who is in the power of, of any belligerent party. So here I conclude. Thank you very much for your time. And if there's any question, I'd be ha happy to take it. Thank you.
thank you very much, Emanuele, uh, once more. Um, yeah, it's um, the, the last month, you know, we constantly uh, read and follow events. And I think that every single topic of international law uh, is related to what we experience. Uh, I don't know if that makes international law more relevant or not, but this is a very, very big discussion. Maybe you would like all to reflect. I know that uh, Ruvi, Ruvi will have to leave earlier by two, if I'm correct, right, Ruvi? So I was wondering, you know, whether you would like to, to add something based on uh, a final note, a final comment, you know, on uh, before you leave us, and then I will open uh, the the floor for the other for the other questions. Is there something you would like to add or comment about? Thanks very much, uh, Maria. So um, there were there were really um, uh, interesting questions in the in the Q A Q and A, which I've I've answered more elaborately. So so I don't want to repeat what I've written there, but I think what does come through from them is is really the you know the the question of uh, um, what can what lessons can we draw from this um, f from the way um, Europe in particular I think obviously this happened on on uh, on European soil the Europe has responded and and whether this this would be a good model in future so so I think I just want to highlight the, the point I made in uh, in a, in relation to, to the last question I think to to Patrick's on. Um, on whether temporary protection directive is is a is a good new refugee route for non-Ukrainian refugees, and and I think here what we need to distinguish, and and of course the temporary protection itself, by its name suggests that it's it is uh, uh, intended to be a a quick fix for something that is happening rapidly um, as a mass influx, and so it's it's limited in time, but also it doesn't include an individualized assessment. That that is that is the nature of the regime, and that's why it also doesn't exclude. Uh, it's notwithstanding a future assessment of refugee protection. So so to the extent we will have a similar, I hope not, but if we had a similar crisis like this uh, somewhere else, and that would render the temporary protection directive relevant, and I should hope it will. At least people will now have a precedent to draw on, which they didn't before. I think the more long-term, as you were, substantive change that the EU and, of course, the UK and many others have to make is to stop using the rhetoric of um, we want to stop the smugglers and we we want to um, we don't want people to risk their lives coming here. And at the same time, not provide them any safe and legal route to come. And uh, what I think has been uncovered also in relation to, to the UK and Ukraine is, well, suddenly it seems that it is possible to um, uh, assess online applications submitted from outside the country and uh, issue somebody a visa on that basis and allow them to come into the country. Uh, so if that possibility exists for Ukrainians, then surely it could also exist for Syrians, for Afghanis, for Somalis, etc. Uh, and there is really no, and without, as I said, I'll, I'll leave other people to to make their judgments around motivations. And, you know, I, these are very charged kind of terms that I'd rather not use myself. But, I, but it is remarkable just how different the approach has been to Ukrainians uh, by governments, by populations as well, but I think actually more by governments. Um, and, and it is something we need to reflect on. And, uh, and I hope everybody who's, who's on the call will, will also and, and take that forward. So, um, so I apologize that at this stage, I will, I will have to leave, uh, but it's, it's been a pleasure and also to hear Mark and Emanuele and, uh, uh, and I wish you best of luck with the rest of the symposium. Thank you very much, Ruby. Thanks a lot for, for your intervention and your comments. And I hope we'll meet soon in person. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, based uh, if I uh, if you allow me, you know, uh, I'm I'm going to to use uh, Ruby's uh, comments, and uh, also you know um, ask a question both to Mark and Emmanuel, and then I will go back to the Q and A. So Ruby said uh, he he highlighted two things. First of all, he said what lessons can we learn out of that? You know. Uh, out of all the, the last month. And the second thing he highlighted was this hyperactivity we see uh, on behalf of international institutions, international lawyers, 
okay? Uh, something that we haven't seen in the past, but uh, uh, we have seen the ICJ being involved, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, different bodies, uh, the General Assembly uniting for peace resolution. And I was wondering, you know, Mark, I will come back to you, um, based on your historical work, but also, you know, trying to, to understand those things, as you mentioned, you know, the, the famous German old doctrine, you know, how it's translated nowadays. Uh, I, I was wondering how, how do you assess uh, all this hyperactivity, you know, of international legal actors uh, on that front? Um, it, it, do they try, do we, if you want, try to reiterate, you know, a status quo, uh, something, you know, we always talk about the end of the world order as we knew it or as we thought we knew it, the ICJ thing, you know, about the unilateral saying that it's doubtful whether unilateral recourse to force, you know, whether it was accepted. How do you assess that, you know, based on, on, on your uh, work? And the last question, uh, and the second question, and maybe it's also for Emanuele, both of you, and then I will go to the other questions, is also, we always talk about the humanization of humanitarian law, right? And it's a question very much related by Theodore Meron and others, you know, and slowly we see also a humanization of use ad bellum, uh, like based on the Human Rights Committee general comment that an aggressive war, you know, uh, produces ipso facto an arbitrary loss of life. Uh, to what extent, you know, do you think that, uh, do we see a kind of, of change into that or not? So I stop here. Mark, would you like and Emanuela to comment on that and then I will go back. Sure, thank you, Maria. But I, I mean, I don't really, how do I assess this, this hyperactivity? I think on the one hand, it's, it's remarkable that the ICJ took this step and um, not took the easy way out of saying, well, we don't really have jurisdiction, even though it is a quite novel construct that led to the ICJ accepting um, its jurisdiction there. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's, they're, they're doing this, but nothing follows from it. And I, I think this, this will have to lead to um, continued discussions we've been having for at least since the end of the Cold War of how the international order um, can actually continue to function as an order when we have uh, states that are, I mean, I, I like to believe it is really just an elite of, of corrupt people who are pursuing an, an ethnic national agenda um, at any cost possible. And that's something that you can't really confront with, with, with legal, uh, with legal values, with legal norms, but I think that that calls into question um, what international law can really do, because we can we can we can talk about it. The United Nations can talk about it, and but once the Security Council talks about it, the veto Russia's veto is the end of it. And um, yeah, I mean, this is leads, especially in Germany. This is leading to a. a, a radical change uh, in talking and thinking about military objectives, which is really nothing that that anybody could want, but um, that, that that is just the place we're at. And um, to address uh, not so much what you were saying, but what some of the other comments um, were, were relating to, and also what Ruby wrote in the chat and about the question whether the, the, the activation of this uh, temporary protection directive, whether that creates, um, somebody was asking whether that creates new uh, routes for refugees. That's not how this directive works at all, because it really is only for people who have a status in, in Ukraine, which had leads in, in the daily work of us migration lawyers, especially here in Berlin, where a lot of people from Ukraine are coming in, um, already leads to new problems because you have people who have studied, for example, in, um, in Ukraine and they don't immediately fall under uh, the rules uh, of this uh, EU directive and Germany is trying to create something but this is all also discriminatory we can obviously again ask the same question there whether uh, 
this shows some kind of institutionalized racism. Um, but at the same time, I, I only have questions really at this stage. That's, that's, that, that is the unfortunate truth. Yeah, and I think that's a very sincere <clears throat> answer. I think more and more, all of us, we have questions, you know. Uh, thank you for that, Emmanuel. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I wonder whether there is really an increased activism of international fora or maybe we're simply more aware of them because, uh, I mean, the Ukraine had already made resort to the ICJ last year. Uh, they brought interstate cases to the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, international institutions have been involved abundantly over the past uh, and, and nobody really paid much attention to, <laughs> to what they were doing. So. Uh, even even back in 2014, after the Crimea invasion, there was there were general assembly resolution condemning condemning the referendum, for instance, which was held in in Crimea. So, I think that uh, what what um, um, Ruvi and, and Mark were saying is actually true. So, I, I'm I'm sorry to have to admit it because but there are double standards on how the whole international community, including international lawyers, are reacting to this phenomenon, possibly because, you know, it's closer to us because we identify more with the victims of this conflict. Uh, I found it interesting what Mark was saying about the, let's say, loopholes, which are still in the, uh, in the temporary protection directive, because, for instance, he was mentioning the fact that individuals who do not have a permanent resident permit in the Ukraine would be excluded from the protection. But also in the Ukrainians who happened to be outside Ukraine before the 24th of February were excluded technically. So if somebody was on a work trip or, or you know, had a, went quickly outside it's, uh, for, for, I don't know, for a quick holiday outside, then he or she would technically be outside. So states are given leeway. Mark, do you want to intervene? Sorry. I, I, I wanted to just quickly illustrate how this how this translates. I represent um, people for, who left Ukraine ages ago and who applied for asylum here under not necessarily very convincing reasons, but who also have very, very severe medical issues. So um, we're in a in I'm in representing them in several court cases where we're talking about whether or not they should get a status as being protected from deportation into Ukraine. And these proceedings have now been brought to a standstill, even though they've been going on for two or three years, because the courts are saying, well, let's see what happens in Ukraine, which is just completely idiotic, because we were arguing for um, medical reasons that to protect their lives, they have to stay in Germany um, because the um, because the medical system in Ukraine couldn't even accommodate their special needs before the war. And now, obviously, the chance that the Ukrainian system uh, could do it is zero. It was non-existent before, but now, given this wonderful treatment that the medical system in Ukraine gets from the Russian forces, I have no, absolutely no understanding why any judge would, under these circumstances, say, well, we'll just, you know, put a halt to the proceedings. They've been going for three years. They can go on longer. But that is the reality also. Yeah, uh, may, may I um, yes, yes, continue? Yes, yes. In fact, this is a, a very uh, clear and evident example of how uh, you know national legal systems sometimes are uh, not really up to standards to do what they should do. But going back to the other question that Maria was asking, whether the humanization of Jusin Bell and Jusat Bellum, uh, whether we're heading in the right direction. Well, of course, with Jusin Bell, uh, I'm all in favor of humanization in the sense. Uh, um, Rui was speaking about the fact, for instance, that there is an obligation to repatriate prisoners of war once, once the conflict is over. And a few years back, there has been new interpretation, which was put forward by the ICTY, saying that it's not necessarily uh, an obligation that a state has, because if the POW doesn't want to go back, uh, because he fears prosecution or for any other reason, why should you send him back to a country where he, he, he doesn't want to go uh, to, to, to return? Um, when it comes to humanizing use uh, ad bellum, on the other hand, I, I also see some merits there. And I know that the Human Rights Committee made a, a very convincing point in its latest general comment on the right to life. My, the doubt which is put forward by, by many scholars or uh, say experts is always that you, you risk 
blurring the lines a bit between uh, use in bellum and use of bellum. You see, the ICRC, for instance, is positive that uh, I don't care about the origins of the conflict. Once the conflict is there, we should always apply IHL in, uh, in an impartial way, in uh, the same way for all. If you start injecting elements of use ad bellum into the picture, then who is to say that some states or the other would not, you know, use them as a pretext to fall short of its obligations under 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 IHL? So it's a very thin line on which uh, you know we need to walk here. And I don't know. We should look at how state practice develops in the coming years. I guess. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, there is something about self-defense, actually, uh, one of the, of, the, of the questions of the q and It's quite interesting uh, that uh, Russia, at the end of the day, said, oh, you know, in, uh, in their submission before the ICJ, that for us, you know, it's just self-defense. It has nothing to do, you know, with, uh, with genocide. Uh, but we have seen, you know, how the legal argumentation and pretext of self-defense has been used and abused and is constantly uh, abused today. I was thinking about the uh, negotiations taking place in Istanbul, we will see President Erdogan as peacemaker, you know, and uh, I couldn't say, uh, I thought, oh my God, I, I, I never thought I would see that as well. Uh, and uh, being a peacemaker, particularly Erdogan himself. Uh, but now, uh, having said that, um, I would like to ask, uh, a final question to you, if that's okay, you know, with you. Uh, and we talked about the double standards when it comes to the reaction, you know, of the European Union and the UK and generally, you know, Europe to the to the war in Ukraine. We saw also many, many companies, you know, we saw what happened with Meta or Facebook, for example, you know, I found some things particularly scary, personally, you know, allowing incitement to violence for particular people, but not for other people, you know, so we, we saw a blurry between the public and the private here as well, and something that we have all over identified about the power that those companies, you know, uh, collect. But also, you know, there is another point that I would like your opinion, if you want to address that as well. Uh, it's it's this what about this? I know we come back and back and back to that. And so President Putin say, who are the West? Who is the West to tell me what to do? You know, uh, do you want to talk again about Iraq in 2003? Do you want to talk about other violations of international law? And uh, Personally, as a teacher, I always found it very challenging when I'm in class, you know, to, to, to find my own language, speaking of language, Mark, and uh, not to, to preach, not to be dogmatic, but try to say why I consider this conflict to be different, you know, from previous violations of international law, having said that I always thought and I always thought that the 2003 Iraq invasion was illegal pure like that, you know. So I was wondering, you know, how do you address those comments yourself and what are your final thoughts, you know, on, uh, on these uh, questions? It's a broader question, you know. Uh, Manuela, you are a teacher as well. Mark, you have been a teacher, but I, I also know that you, uh, you, you interact, you know, with, uh, with many people. So what are your final thoughts on that? Thank you. Mark or Emanuele, whoever wants to take the floor. Um, uh, like I said, I don't really have answers at, at this point. I think um, we, I think we do have to understand that um, we, what when we talk about international law, that's not necessarily how other international lawyers always see international law there are i mean if you compare and i've done this um in the book as well if you can uh, if you compare the narratives for example over kosovo that are uh, sort of part of the canon of international of western international law um there are very very different uh, differently presented in russian textbooks i mean i don't i don't speak russian unfortunately but other people do and they've they, they've analyzed this and it is very sobering to just really look at that and i mean i personally have lots of problems with kosovo and legality and legitimacy and everything but the one-sided view that is prevalent in russian textbooks on this and chinese textbooks as well really 
brings us to the question of how international is international law, law really. Um, obviously, it's very international when everybody comes together at the United Nations Assembly, um, but then it's also obviously very limited um, at the Security Council, um, especially considering the veto powers. So um, I think that is a conversation that we will be having a long time. And, uh, <clears throat> And there is this one that there are these some of these questions in the comments that I understand to be at least partly motivated by some understanding of the Russian position. I, I have to say the, the Russian claim that it is somehow threatened by the expansion of NATO. I, I don't think it's credible, but because the way I understand the development of security thinking, at least in the West, it is not about territorial gains. It, it just isn't. And um, if you can't really counter um, somebody who, who, who does not share that understanding or that, that, that those values with arguments, I, that's, yeah. Anyway, it's a conversation that'll be ongoing. Thank you, Mark. Manuel. Yes, well, uh... Many say that it's a sad hour for international law and uh, for international law, not for international lawyers, because we've been very, very busy over the last few weeks. Uh, unfortunately, I would add. Um, well, my opinion is that, uh, of course, some some of the motivations which have been put forward by by Russia to justify its intervention are clearly outside the realm of what can, you know, uh, admitted to be even vaguely legal in the international legal arena. So, uh, of course, uh, it's easy for uh, Mr. Putin and, and for Russia to say that uh, the West did it first. I mean, uh, the intervention in Iraq was not <laughs> based on any solid legal ground. Um, one might argue whether intervention in Syria was based on legal on solid legal grounds. So again, it's a name and blame game that you know nobody should be playing, I guess. Um, my impression is that, uh, as I said, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a time where, uh, I don't know, I, I want to see these, I mean, uh, it would be a positive time if we were, would be able to assert that, you know, certain conducts are really and definitely uh, illegal. So at least it would sort of set certain uh, milestones, so to say, that uh, you know should be preserved. Let's say, let's say for, as they say, for future generation. The sense that when when you face a violation of international law, if you're able to call it a, a violation, that's already something uh, significant. My doubt is that at times uh, these very politically charged uh, discussions sometimes blur the lines between legal and political uh, opinions and hence uh, this does not really contribute to make any clarity on, on on these points i don't know whether this was a satisfying answer but this is the, the, the well what little i can say about it no there is no satisfying answer it's like you think i don't know mark do you want to say something i saw some reaction and then just to wrap up um i completely agree with with emmanuel that uh, it is obviously uh, something meaningful when we can say this is a clear violation of international law. That 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 is the whole purpose of of the language of international law. That that it gives us that power to say this is a violation. This is illegal. We all know that nothing follows from it uh, if there is no will to make anything follow from it. But I have to say, in the current circumstance, that that understanding of international law doesn't really give me much hope. It just, it, it just leads me to think how many times do we need to say never again? Mm, yeah. Yes, well, on, on that note, you made me think that um, a couple, two weeks ago we had another round table and I asked the same question, you know, to, uh, to the other speakers. 
Uh, one of them was Jan Chambers, who was quite, I wouldn't say um, pessimist, but he say the international law for me is hopeless in times of crisis. That's what he said, you know. Uh, and then always he claims, you know, that they, we don't talk about the crisis of international law, we talk about the crisis of international lawyers. It looks like that we have moved from crisis because it's been five years now we deal with crisis and backlash, and now we have this resurrection of international law somehow, you know, when people never care about international law now, they ask, what does international law say? Why doesn't international law do something? What about war crimes? When will Putin be prosecuted? These are the questions, you know, I always have on the table. And then my answers are never satisfactory, you know, because I say, well, ideally, hypothetically, it's likely, it's unlikely for the time being, you know, this is a the type of language we, we use. Uh, being uh, lawyers, uh, but um, have to say that, you know, I want really to thank you for this uh, discussion, which went beyond, you know, a kind of uh, doctrine, 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 but I wanted to to question you and to share with you uh, and the, the, the attendees uh, uh, what we think, what we problematize about, you know, that they, we don't have answers. I think more and more, more and more we have questions, and I think that's good. To be honest, I don't find it necessarily, you know, oh my God, we have we 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 have questions. And maybe, maybe something will come out uh, um, from all these uh, process. But for the time being, we are all extremely privileged, you know, to talk about law. You understand what I'm talking when a couple of thousand kilometers, hundred of kilometers away from us, we have people, you know, who starve to death and die from dehydration and stuff like that. So uh, I always finish with uh, Albert Camus, who is my, my model, you know, and when he said, maybe, you know, the only answer he wrote is uh, decency in the plague in his book. I really believe that in those times, you know, being decent, each of us, you know, matters a lot. And uh, I think, you know, we don't have big projects. I don't believe in big projects and big words. But maybe, you know, like Mark as a, my immigration lawyer, lawyer, you know, you, Emmanuel, as an academic uh, scholar, and not only myself for my position, you know, maybe we can, maybe decency is the answer at the end of the day and take it from there, you know. So on that note, I want to thank you very much for this discussion. I hope I, I, I technically I did it properly, you know, and this is recorded and we will have it and I will send it to you. I want to thank the people who participated. I know we are towards the end of our semester. You know, I want to thank um, uh, uh, all of you and I really hope we will continue these discussions, you know, because it feels good to share these thoughts with people, you know, who have the same anxieties, if I can use that word, you know. And um, thank you. And be safe, be well, and continue your good work. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And uh, hopefully, see you in person. Okay, sure. Hopefully. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, you participants. thank you all. Okay. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. Thank you very much.